Hi all, my name is Mess Barnkop from Casa Power Electronics. Today I am doing a circuit analysis of the Nokian Siemens Networks FRGL base station amplifier. It is a 2 times 50 watt RF output powered amplifier at 1800 MHz. This has been used as the VCDMA or likely uh, third generations protocols in a smartphone telecom network. So we are going to do this by looking at the CPU and controller section first marked with red here. Then we're going to look at the transmit section, the green with marked TX, which then goes down to the blue marked PA power amplifier parts before going into the filter not shown here, also called a diplexer. From here we will also see the receiving signal, which goes back up into the yellow area here, marked RX, and how that goes back up into the CPU area. So, let's get started. Here at the close-up of the CPU part of the circuit, I have labeled all the CPUs and RAMs and timing circuits that we find interesting. But uh, before we dive into this, uh, from my previous videos you have probably seen that Nokia engineers likes to nickname their ICs with a Finnish nickname. And uh, I have seen before something like Murno, which uh, means AND, so that was used for a smaller IC. So here underneath on the RX board we have two um, ICs named Heppo, which I have been told means a ordinary guy. But both of these ordinary guys feed data into the PIMO IC, which means a single woman under 30. So make up of that what you want, but uh, that is just a loose translation of the nicknamed ICs from their Finnish nicknames. So yeah, let's dive into the PC board itself. If we start out at the optical interface we have over here, that is a dual fiber line interface which goes into a marble chip here, which is a 7 port, 100 megabit per second switch as well. Now that is connected through the uh, Halo Quattro 4 port uh, Ethernet isolation transceiver down here, which basically just isolates the network interfaces between the different CPUs. Now the main controller that uh, takes care of everything inside this is the IBM PowerPC Hero here, which is a RISC CPU, which uh, basically has everything built in embedded. It's a 533 MHz clock, and it has its own 4x128 MB DDR SD RAM sitting above it. Now the transmit um, digital to analog converters sits on the back side of this board, and I think that's actually split into two sections. On one side we have a NEC chip, which is uh, yeah just with a Nokia part number and it's nicknamed INSPAP. And if we go to the other side, we have a Altera Stratix GX, which is a FPGA with integrated transceiver capabilities. The um, clocks that we have inside this, we have a 153.6 MHz oscillator sitting up here. That connects down to a Texas Instruments 1 to 5 PLL clock synchronizer, so that synchronizes and splits out the clock from the main oscillator to five isolated outputs. And from that we also have a 1 to 10 differential clock distribution chip from Texas Instruments. So the one oscillator is split out into many different CPUs and circuits from here. A Altera Stratix 2 FPGA, which is along with 2 times 128 MB SD RAM. And we can see we have another one sitting over here. And those are used one for each transmitting amplifier, I think so. Now the receiving CPU that I mentioned was this, the PMU R2. A NEC chip with a Nokia part number. And underneath here we have the two... I see sitting on the receiving board, which we will look at later. The transmitting part of the CPU board sits out here to the right and to the left. So let's first go to the back side where we have the input connectors from and to the power amplifier. Here we are at the back side of the CPU board and I hope you can keep this in a straight line now because we're going to swift back and forth between the back side and the front side of this PCB because the signal routes back and forth between the two sides. So at first over here we have the NXP CPU here, we have the NXP TDA 9935, which is a dual DAC, 
digital to analog conversion, 14 bit, 160 mega samples per second. Now that roots down under the board here and we have to switch to the front side where we have these two white circles sitting up here going through a couple of impedance matching networks over to the analog devices 80, 83, 49, which is a 7 me 700 megahertz to 2.7 gigahertz up conversion mixer. Now up conversion mixers work and as well as down conversion mixers work by then maintaining the signal but on a lower or higher frequency. So I made a simple video explaining that, so check out that link in the description. Now we jump back to the front of the pre-power amplifier on the other side again. And we have from the back side up conversion mixer sitting over here to the right here. From the back side up conversion mixer we go up here. So we have here a Markham 4VA voltage variable attenuator, but before that we have a small amplifier chip, which is uh, the RF micro devices SPA 4089 set. And we actually do have two of these. We have another one sitting up here before entering the ceramic bandpass filter. And I will just put a photo in of that, where you can see it in details from the side that it is a split up filter that we run through the middle and then it is three or four pole to one or the other side. From here on, on it goes up through a unknown smaller amplifier or switch and it disappears into the board here and goes up over here and we have the output to the power amplifier. The output from the DAC and preamplifiers comes down here at the bottom of the board so let's just zoom in. So we have the signal coming in here through this route and we can see just a small impedance matching at the start here and at first we have a Anarin Singer 3db hybrid coupler which then splits it out into two smaller RF micro devices RF2128 which is a 100 milliwatt linear amplifier. Now these two amplifiers operate 90 degrees out of phase before it is fed into another Anarin Singer hybrid coupler and the signal is joined together again. From here it continues on through some various inductors and a small circulator, capacitors, and we get into the first large nice golden power amplifier here which is a NXP BL 6G22 45 watt LD mass amplifier made for 2000 to 2.2 gigahertz RF signal. At the output we have a small capacitance stop before entering into another small circulator here. And we follow along some more impedance matching. And we have another Anarin Singer hybrid coupler before the signal is split out into the two main power amplifier ICs. And look at these babies. They are absolutely huge. These are NXP BLF 6G2280 watt power LD mass transistors. Look at that. And uh, actually the factory producing these have been since 2015 uh, been sold off to Amplion. So the, that is no longer NXP chips. But the two uh, outputs from here is fed into a quarter wave length um, output join here. And we can follow the signal go up through here. We have a microstrip coupler for the feedback that we will look at and come back to the, yeah, actually the feedback receiving part of the transmitter that we saw before, that half of the ICs we did not talk about. We will go back to that right in a moment. But here we have the output circulator. And a circulator works that you can put a signal into port one and it has a magnetic field due to um, yeah, magnets inside that the RF energy will only move from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, or from 3 to 1. So that means any reflected energy from the antenna and filter that comes back into 2 will get reflected down into port 3, which is a 50 ohm termination. So by that, no reflected energy from the antenna gets back into the back of the amplifier. And over here we have the output plug, which goes to the diplexer. So let's follow the feedback back that goes from the microstrip coupler. This is used to adjust the transmitting power of the amplifier and as we can see it's buried deep down in the eight layer or six layer PCB here 
with heavily ground stitched parts all around. And it's going all the way back over here at the edge of the PCB, around the screw hole here, continues, continues. You can see it goes over here and actually ends up over next to where we have the input over here and we have the other connector here, which we will see now on the transmitting DAC part of the PCB. And that's what we have here, the input feedback, which then goes to the back side uh, to the down conversion mixer. So let's get to the back side. So the back side down conversion mixer, we have down here the input feedback, which goes up through a small bit of impedance matching. We can follow the line up here to the first Maxim 9996, which is a down conversion mixer. Works exactly the same as the up conversion mixer, that it uses a yeah, external clock, which gives it a intermediate frequency, and it then samples down onto a lower frequency carrier frequency, but maintaining all the signal. In some places, we will also see this plankton uh, IC here. It's from ST Microelectronics, but it's only marked with a Nokia serial number. Impossible to find anything on it, but it seems to be distributed all around different places where you have, yeah, some kind of um, maybe. Um, CRC checking, checksum checking, maybe some security, but uh, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery chip. Could also be a microcontroller that is just rebranded. But from here we have again a impedance matched uh, output, which go to the front analog to digital conversion. So let's go to the front again. And we have to dive down here and we can see from the back side down conversion mixer, we go into a NXP TDA 9910, which is a analog to digital converter, 10 bit up to 370 megahertz intermediate frequency. And that again has to do with the down conversion frequency. So um, that tells us at least that the 18, 1800 megahertz signal carrier signal is down converted to below 370 megahertz carrier signal before being converted back to a digital bitstream. This uh, digital bitstream is then fed back out onto the CPUs sitting on the other side. So let's get back to the power amplifier that now has a amplified signal going into the diplexer. The output filter or input filter or diplexer or bandpass filter that we have here is very narrowly precisely engineered for the 1800 megahertz carrier frequency and we can see over here at the left side that we have tuning pins and also along with automatic tuning with small geared servo motors. So if we just zoom in on this picture and we start up here at the antenna connectors then we have two pa panels connecting to, uh, to one filter here. And what we have is that the one goes as a receiving antenna and one goes as a transmitting and receiving antenna. So if we take the receiving poles of the filter, we can see that we have receiving one, two, three, four, and five before it goes down into the bottom here and back to the PCB. So that means we have a five pole filter sitting at the receiving part and for the sending where we have the input down here at the bottom connector, we have sending one, two, three, and four. So that makes up a four pole filter. And as we can see on the graphics I had here, um, that gives the, not, not a, a really good sharp characteristic of this filter. Then you would see that you had cross couplings, which means that you would have more chambers with some smaller windows between them or bridges between the chambers. And that gives a sharper um, band pass. But this is uh, a pretty, you know, what you call old school, normal filter that does not have these magic tricks. So, which is also, yeah, normal for a three third generation base station amplifier. Here on the receiving PCB, that we can see the two large NC CPUs at the top. Um, we have the input connectors down here at the bottom, and we have all the middle is filled up with clocks and uh, surveillance uh, circuits that we will take a closer look at. But uh, we can see that it's just a lot of passives and uh, 
a bit of very tiny RF amplifiers and filters sitting right next to the connectors. And if we go to the back side of this PCB, we can see that we have the tracks going up here and we have a down conversion mixer, which we will take a closer look at. Again, we can find this uh, plankton microcontroller that I do not know what comes from, but the signal goes from the connectors up through some more filterings and maybe it's even saw filters that we have sitting here, sonic acoustic wave filters. I have another video explaining that, so check that out in the description. But now that goes into a ST microelectronics Smurf nicknamed Nokia um, part number chip and that is most likely a dual down conversion mixer. From here on it's fed up through impedance matching networks and we are getting back to the other side. Now in the middle here we have a STLD1086 which is a 3.3 volt 1.5 amp regulator for the ICs that we have on the front side. So let's get back here and down to the input connectors and the signal that we have around here. So if we take a look at the um, some of the ICs we have down here, the Texas Instrument LM75A, which is an I2C bus temperature sensor, we see a lot of these throughout the whole amplifier. It's on all boards and it's everywhere. So there's a lot of temperature measurements done inside the amplifier. Now the funny thing is that many of these actually connect up to a Texas Instrument uh, PF575, which is an 8-bit I2C I/O expander IC. And as we can follow the tracks up here, it goes through with some um, yeah connecting through through rods connectors. Ah, I forgot the word of those. But let's go back to the back side again, and I'm pretty sure we could find those down here. And we have the same feed throughs here, go up through another, um, yeah, either multiplexer or some kind of uh, that, that goes into the plankton version, maybe that collects the LM75A measurements. And that also speaks to the um, to my theory that this is a rebranded microcontroller of some sorts. So back at the front here. Then we have some uh, distributed clocks and uh, synthesizers sitting up here. Uh, we have uh, a multiband RF frequency synthesizer which makes the intermediate frequency for the up and down conversion mixers. And again we can uh, recognize some of the um, yeah, clock and uh, distribution ICs that we saw on the CPU board that we simply have some smaller amplifiers and distributing ICs um, yeah, 1 to 10 different old clock distribution chip here. And that just ensures that we operate with the same clock on all these ICs. So in each side we have two texture instruments, ADS55221, which is a 12-bit analog to digital converter at 105 mega samples per second. And we have two of them because we are running dual lines and yeah, this is then a single line chip. And we have two signals out of phase from each other and that is fed up into the NEC Nokia part number CPU here which is nicknamed Heppo which was ordinary guy or the dude or guy uh, not quite sure as it is Finnish slang. At first I did not mention the power supply but, but of course we're going to take a look at that as well. We have the input plug here the silvery uh, shield which says 48 volt DC at max 18 amps. And what we have here at the input is a few MOSFETs probably doing some uh, input switching. So uh, let's just uh, dive into, um, let's uh, just uh, take a look at the overview here. Uh, we have the yellow connectors here, which goes down to the power amplifiers or the CPU board. And what we can see from the transformers or output chokes, we can see that we have at least four different Oh, five. We also have a set of transformers here. So we have five different power supplies sitting in this. And if we first take a look at the center, because that's where we have the controller. Here we have a Freescale MC908A, which is an 8 megahertz MCU, with some built-in flash and EEPROM memory. But if we take a look at these white circles that I have um, put up here, we can see that we have 1.5 volt, 1.2, 1.8, 
28, 6.5, 5 volt and 32 volt. So we have a lot of different IC and differential um, voltages. Then we have the 28 volts for the power amplifiers and we have 32 for, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure what the 32 is for. But if we take a look at the two power amplifier um, circuits, we have uh, a, I think there's actually only one that we have uh, this main because that's a full bridge um, FR3709 MOSFETs, 30 volt, 86 amps, but maybe that's not used for that. I would actually be surprised if we saw something like the 200 volt up here that would not be for that. What would be the 28 volt? That would most likely be 60 volt spec um, MOSFETs. But I don't believe it's these single switches that we have setting out the edges. As these are mounted down here next to this. I'm pretty sure that we have this, but 30 volt rated MOSFETs seems pretty narrow to a 20 volt um, DC output. There is absolutely no headroom. But then again, this is a very closely um, regulated DC voltage that it's fed already. It's fed with 48 volts. So, yeah, maybe it's being uh, chopped down here at the start by a smaller single switch uh, power supply. That could also be a, an option. But as you can see, this board is absolutely packed back and forth and just have a single controller. So it's, it's actually hard to make out which actually goes where. And I did not want to waste too much time dissecting a power supply that is so highly integrated, but merely just show what kind of MOSFETs and diodes and controller has been used inside of this. Inside the lid of each diplexer is of course also the control and power supply to control the servo motors for auto adjusting. And it also have a small analog section, section for the monitoring output at the front which a field engineer can plug into. So let's just dive into this. At the middle we have a Freescale NXP Cold Fire MC5208 32-bit MCU and it's just a yeah, embedded computer with everything. It has SD-RAM controller, DMA controller, and built-in Ethernet controller. And above it has some um, 16 megabit flash RAM, but it does also have a 1000 megabit Ethernet transceiver from Maxwell sitting next to it. Oh, from Marvel. And all we have over here to the left side is power supply and control of the servo motors, and some a lot of protection because this sits directly on the Maxwell sits directly on the diplexer and has yeah, a good chance of seeing some transients from uh, antenna being hit by lightning or such. So let's move on over to the monitoring part where we have some nice RF analog black magic going on. Now we have a um, input from the antenna, that little shoulder blob up here. At first we have a entering Singer 2 which is a yeah, 120 watt coupler. Just look at that small component. You can push that much high frequency energy through that. But what we do get is a 90 degree out of phase um, signal that goes into a Wilkinson power combiner. And uh, I'll just put up a little graphic explaining how that actually works. And we can see we have a small impedance matching resistor at the both the input and the output and then we have a certain length of uh, wire in between that makes up the coupling or splitter and what's worth noting here is that we have a 50 ohm impedance matched tracks here but in a splitter you would have a 70 ohm match and that's why you see a thinner line here and when it gets combined again it's again a 50 ohm and we get down through as a more passive and impotent matching and possibly uh, a bit of feedback going back here. Yeah, so it actually seems to be some kind of feedback loop that can be activated by the small switches sitting along the line. So down here we have a lot more of Anorant Singer 3db 90 degree couplers that again 
with some switches can be switched on and off so you can change the signal from being phase out of phase and yeah all kinds of magic that you want to do when you try to monitor this output and again over here we see a Wilkinson power splitter before moving into two small amplifiers and then again a power combiner and going out to the output plug and underneath here we have a identical circuit just mirrored I hope you enjoyed this circuit analysis and I hope you learned something about RF electronics design and yeah, what design choices there was made in third generation base station amplifiers. I have jumped over a lot of different theory and different techniques simply because it's impossible to cover all these topics in a single video, tearing down a complete amplifier with all controls. So I hope this, if you like RF electronics, gave you some brought on the tooth to dive into it and uh, learn some more about it yourself or at least just say oh wow hey that was interesting now I know that now I can move on with my life so thank you for watching and I hope you will subscribe to my channel if you find videos like this interesting so until next time see ya